morning. Um, it's really an honor to be invited to uh, speak here today. I think based on my last name, perhaps you might have been hoping I was going to be able to speak Italian, but sadly, no. <laughs> um, I teach at uh, Fordham University in New York, and where I do research on the economics of media, and in particular on the economics of, of audiences. And I was fortunate enough that uh, one of your colleagues actually reads a, a blog, maybe he's one of the four people who read a blog that I write, uh, dealing with some of these issues as I've been particularly interested in the ways uh, that the measurement of audiences uh, is changing and what the implications of that are for um, different sectors of the media for advertising, et, et cetera. Uh, and let me apologize a bit if I speak a little fast. Being a combination of being Italian and being from New York means that uh, I tend to speak pretty quick, but I'm trying to slow it down uh, for today. Uh, but again, what I want to talk about today, let me get this, there we go, uh, is based on some work I've been doing for a number of years. Uh, I did a book in 2003 called Audience Economics in which I really tried to begin to um, understand how the economics of audiences are unique from other different types of, of products. Uh, and then just last year, as of course, as we all know, there's been so much technological change uh, that it became really important to understand, to start to try to understand how uh, the nature of the media audience is evolving, uh, both in terms of the technologies that we use to consume and produce media, but then also very important, which I'll talk quite a bit about today, in terms of the technologies that are used to measure how we use media uh, and the new insights and the new opportunities, uh, but also the new challenges uh, that come from these uh, new tools. And most recently, and I'll talk a bit about some of this research, I did, I did a report on, in particular, how social media are being used as a new audience measurement tool uh, that I'll talk a bit about today. And I'll be, actually, you get a first look at some of this research that we're going to be presenting to the American Association of Advertising Agencies uh, in September. Uh, so to start, uh, just to put this in context, I've developed a model of what I call audience evolution, and it tries to capture uh, the range of factors that are, are provoking the changes that we see taking place today. Uh, the two main factors to think about, the first uh, we're very familiar with are the ways in which technologies are transforming how we consume media. Uh, we know, for example, that audiences are becoming increasingly fragmented across many different platforms, across many different content options, and this makes the traditional ways of measuring and valuing audiences increasingly difficult. Uh, but at the same time, and this is the part of, of, that I think is, is kind of interesting, that those same technological changes that are undermining the traditional ways of measuring and valuing audiences are also opening up new opportunities, new feedback mechanisms, new sources of data, new what I call new audience information systems, new ways of gathering information and gathering uh, points of potential value uh, in the media audience. Uh, all that happens within a, an, or an environment of what I call stakeholder resistance and negotiation, uh, which as we all know, any change in how audiences are measured and values can benefit some stakeholders, but potentially harm others. And there is a, a sort of a complex process of negotiation that ultimately takes place. And the end result can be a, a new and different conceptualization uh, of the media audience, some new forms of value that essentially are uh, emerging. Traditionally, uh, and here I've tried to map out what I see as all the different components of being in the audience, uh, sort of in a progression. So it begins with, are we aware? Then the next step would be, well, we are aware, are we interested? Uh, then gets to the traditional source of value, uh, which is, are we exposed? Uh, but as, as this model is meant to represent, that process of exposure where, where the, the bulk of the value has historically been based, really because that's what's historically been the focus of measurement, 
uh, is only part of, a, of the beginning of a much more complex process, really, where we can get to issues such as uh, are we attentive, are we loyal, after that, do we appreciate the content we've been exposed to? Did it have any kind of emotional impact on us? Uh, following that, are we able to recall it? Did it result in any attitude change? And then potentially after that, did it produce any particular type of behavioral change? A lot of this I put under the broad umbrella of a terminology. I don't know if it's taken hold here the way it has in the US, but the terminology that gets used a lot these days is engagement. Um, in the US, nobody knows what that means. Everyone has their own opinion of what it means. There are a hundred different definitions, uh, but the term gets used to describe all sorts of different things. But the point here is that um, as we look at what's happening today, there are opportunities to measure uh, things other than exposure and to potentially identify then and to capture other sources of value beyond uh, just the basic notion of was an audience exposed to a particular type of content or message. I call it the post-exposure audience marketplace. And the idea is that exposure is diminishing, not going away, but diminishing as a source of audience value uh, and is being supplemented by a wide range of other dimensions of being part of, of the audience. Now, what I want to talk about today are some of the concerns that I have as someone who, well, who really researches folks like yourself. I do research on the advertising industry, on the media measurement industries, on the, on the content industries. Uh, and in this process of audience evolution that's ongoing, and again, this is based primarily on observations that I've been making uh, within the US. Uh, but these are the, the concerns that I see uh, that are, are you know, come to my attention in observing this process of audience evolution as it goes forward. The first is what I call the notion of black box audiences. I don't know if that term black box is used here. Uh, what it, it means is the idea that something emerges from a system that's very complicated, uh, that most people don't have access to the inner workings of, and so we take the output as a given, but we don't really know how it was created. Uh, sometimes people talk about search engines, for example, as a black box. We don't really understand the algorithms behind what our search output is, but when we get those, you know, when we get the results, we use them. We don't really question it. What we're increasingly seeing, as I'll talk about a bit more, uh, is that the the systems and the mechanisms by which audience data are produced are very complex and are very unclear, more so than in previous iterations of how we measure audiences. And so the audience output becomes sort of a black box for those in the position of being consumers of this audience data. Uh, the other issue I want to talk about today is what I call data determinism. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the concept of technological determinism, of which this is sort of a relative. Uh, but technological determinism was this belief that technology drives social and cultural and institutional change. And it's associated with sort of an uncritical acceptance that technology is capable of solving our problems, is capable of um, always answering the questions that need to be answered. Uh, data determinism is something that I'm observing, again, within the context of the US, which is this idea, not only you know, the notion that, of course, we could believe that audience data are central to driving and improving organizational performance, but this increasingly uncritical acceptance and assumption that all the new types of data that are available are valuable, are useful. Uh, we see, I, we, this is something I'll talk about, I, I've seen quite a bit in the research that I'm doing uh, in the US. And so it's something I wanna emphasize as, as a point of concern uh, as this process of audience evolution continues. Uh, in the US, again, maybe this is happening here as well, the current focus of a lot of this uh, interest is on social media analytics. And by that I mean uh, the variety of ways in which data can be gathered from online conversations, of course from social media platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Uh, but right now there's a lot of discussion about the data that can be derived from social media analytics essentially serving as a new currency in understanding the size and the value of audiences for all types of media content. Uh, but the real focus of what I'm gonna talk about today, and it has been the focus of many of these providers thus far, has been on television. And the idea that maybe we don't 
need Nielsen ratings anymore, that we just need to look to how much online conversation is happening about television programs, uh, and that can serve as a, as a meaningful currency. Uh, it's getting a tremendous amount of attention uh, in, in, the, in the trade press these days, as some of these examples are meant to illustrate. Uh, for those who are not familiar, some of you probably are quite familiar, but what do social TV analytics do? Uh, a variety of things. You could assess a program's performance uh, across a range of criteria, not only uh, in terms of the quantity of online comments, what are the most social, what are the most talked about programs, but also in terms of the share of online comments, what share of the conversation happening about TV programs at a particular point in time was about your program. You could get at the actual sentiment, how many people talking about your program liked it, how many people didn't like it, uh, that becomes a, a component. And there's a ways to develop more uh, sort of nuanced measures of concepts such as involvement. And it's interesting that these are the types of things that often tend to become proprietary, really within the black box that is, uh, measurement firms will have a, a measure of involvement that you can use, but they won't tell you how they came up with it. Uh, you could assess content. You could assess which plot lines or characters uh, audiences are responding to positively. Uh, you could assess in some of these services the performance of individual advertisements. How did your 30-second spot do? How did your product placement do? Again, all on the basis of gathering wide ranges of online social media conversation data. You could track affinities across brands and programs. So for example, do people who like a particular type of car or who talk about a particular type of car, do they tend to watch particular programs uh, or vice versa? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, program to program, that is, do people who talk about this type, this particular program, how often do they talk about another program? So you could examine relationships between products and programs and between different programs. Uh, you can analyze trends over time increasingly as these data are beginning to be archived, though many of these services are quite new. Uh, and you could do a limited amount, and I emphasize that because at this point it's still fairly limited the extent to which demographic data can be gathered about um, the individual commenters who are, who are being analyzed, uh, which really puts us in a different realm than what, what traditional media buying and selling have been used to, of course. Uh, and increasingly you can inf measure the influence and the reach of uh, the comments that are being made. So a celebrity commenting that they watch a particular show on their Twitter account would gen generate more influence, reach, et cetera, than say me. Uh, how is it done? Again, some of you may be familiar with this, but I'll just real briefly talk about the, the ways this is done. Data are gathered from a variety of online social media sources, Twitter, public Facebook pages, all private Facebook pages are not accessible, and that's an important thing to emphasize that most of these services, all of them to this point, are really not able to capture the data uh, about social, uh, about television conversation that's happening on Facebook, except if people make their pages public. Uh, there are a growing number of what we call TV check-in platforms that people are using, different types of applications online and on their mobile devices, just to, to tell other people what show they're watching. That data, <coughs> excuse me, gets fed into many of these new social media, social TV analytics services. Some other online communities and some of them actually rely on online news media conversation and, and stories as well. Um, where things get fairly complicated is in terms of the different algorithms that are used both to gather and to categorize all of this information. Uh, and in some cases, this information can then be synchronized with program schedule or actual content data. So some services can actually tell you uh, what was being said in response to a very specific thing that happened in a particular program at a particular point in time. And a variety of analytic outputs can be created from um, these different inputs, as, uh, as I sort of discussed already. Um, and so, and, and what's interesting about this is I'll talk about this is a very competitive marketplace right now. A number of different providers are in this space. And the important thing to recognize is they all go about producing these measures of, of online engagement very differently. They differ in terms of the data sources that they use. Some rely almost exclusively on Twitter. Some rely on a much broader range of platforms. Uh, they differ in terms of the algorithms that they use and the search terms that they use to associate conversation with particular programs. They differ in terms of the measurement period. Some only measure three hours before and three hours after a program airs. Some measure for a number of days. 
They differ in terms of the granularity, and by that I mean how much detail they seek to gather uh, about this conversation. So there's all sorts of points of differentiation that can lead to, as, as some of my data will show, um, very different products uh, within what we, seems like a fairly you know, narrowly defined area of, of audience value. These are not even all of the services that are operating in the US right now, but it's a very crowded marketplace. Um, I'm going to focus in a few minutes on data that I was able to obtain from three of the largest providers and uh, I gratefully uh, acknowledge their support and their willingness to provide some of their data to me. Uh, this was done in connection with an organization based in New York called the Collaborative Alliance, which is an advertising industry uh, consortium and, and think tank that I've been working with. Uh, there are, as you might guess, as I'm describing, uh, a variety of methodological concerns that you might have as you think about this new way of measuring and valuing the, the television audience. Um, which audience segments and tastes are represented and which aren't? Uh, that is, you might be saying, well, I don't really go online and talk about what shows I like, and I don't know anybody who does. Uh, well, this creates a scenario where those people who do engage in this type of activity become the, uh, a very influential uh, Stakeholder group, obviously, as we know that you, know, you can only, that which gets measured gets valued. Uh, how susceptible are these systems to manipulation? Uh, a variety of, of of tools can be used to uh, game the system, uh, as we might say. Uh, how accurately are they capturing the full range of program discussion? And this goes to not only the range of search terms that are employed, but the range of platforms that are analyzed. Uh, these are all the questions that need to be answered, though I would argue that that's one of the big problems we're seeing right now, is that they're not really being asked uh, as much as they should be. Um, some of these quotes I'm gonna, dis I'm gonna show you now are quotes from interviews that I've been doing in the US with uh, a variety of different types of professionals, folks such as yourself, to see what their concerns are about this new approach to measuring and valuing the audience. For example, on this issue of methodological transparency and clarity, the idea of audiences emerging from this sort of black box, um, this is a very common sentiment that I hear. Uh, as one interview uh, participant told me, they never tell you what's in the black box. There's no transparency. This is a very competitive environment right now amongst all these providers, and there are these powerful incentives to keep a lot of what they do secret. And as folks involved in the buying and selling of audiences, that puts you in a very difficult position of, of, of not being sure what the heck it is you're actually buying to help you understand the audience. Um, the other issue just is, is, is a new sort of disconnect that's emerging between the type of audience research professionals that are out there. If you look at this quote, people who are qualified to come up with solutions are coming from a completely different direction from traditional media research people. Uh, this is because these are, these are computer scientists now. Uh, and computer scientists and audience researchers have traditionally spoken very different languages. Uh, and so there is a, you know, a bit of disconnect happening right now. Um, Despite these issues, here is some examples of what I call this sort of creeping data determinism. On these methodological issues, as a number of, of the interview uh, participants uh, I've spoken to have told me, they don't know anyone that really cares. Uh, because, um, as this quote also points out, people are fairly accepting of all the limitations of the samples at this point. And this tells us a lot, I think, about how desperate uh, participants in the audience marketplace are right now for something uh, some new source of value to help them compensate for the um, shortcomings in the traditional forms of audience value. Uh, and as one interview, uh, one, one research executive told me, as he says, all this stuff is not research to know, it's research to show. Uh, audience researchers in the U.S. seem to be very focused, and this was a term that came up quite a bit in my research, on telling stories. They want to be able to have a good story to tell advertisers. And if they can't tell a traditional rating story that's compelling, they will move on and tell a audience engagement social media story. And so that, that you know, that, that is, a, is an eye opener. It reminds us of how, how audience data and audience research are often used in a very strategic way, of course. But we need to interrogate these new measurement systems. And in the time that I have, I'm just gonna present a little bit of time, some quick analyses that we've done on some of these new audience information sources. This chart represents the percentage of overlap in the top 25 programs 
uh, across a number of different data sources. Not only three of the major social media analytic sources, Trender, Bluefin, and General Sentiment, but we're also able to compare this overlap with the level of overlap with Nielsen household level ratings and Nielsen 12 to 34 year old ratings, just as a point of comparison. So if you look at the, at the, on the first row, uh, you'll see, for example, that two of the major social media analytics services, Bluefin and Trender, have an overlap of 40%. So 40% of the programs in the top 25 list of those two services, and this is for one week that we sampled, are the same. Now, this is open to interpretation. Is 40% a lot? Is 40% a little? To me, I, I tend to think that if these are two services that are both measuring the most popular programs online based on social media conversation, and we're only seeing 40% overlap, I tend to think that that's a little less than one might expect. And it is, I think, a, an indicator of how methodologically different these sources can be, how they're essentially providing very different products. General sentiment in Bluefin, again, 40%. Now, when you look at the comparisons with Nielsen data, 32% in both cases. Uh, if we go to the next row, we can see again here, now we compare another of the two services, General Sentiment and Trender, and they overlap at 36%. And in terms of how they overlap, how Trender overlaps with Nielsen data, 28% at the household level, 40% at the 12 to 34 level. That starts to indicate a pattern that I would have expected, which is to see more overlap when we focus on 12 to 34 year olds, because as you might expect, that is sort of the age group that is engaged quite a bit in this sort of online conversation about television programs. And then we go to the last row, and we see there uh, very low levels of, a of overlap with Nielsen data, 16% uh, at the household level, but again, bumping up to 32% at the 12 to 34 year old level. But I was also interested in, and bear with me on these next couple of slides, I think it's important not just to know how much overlap there is, but where. Uh, we often assume that if we're looking at competing measurement systems, that at the very least they'll agree quite a bit early on amongst the most popular programs. Uh, those of you familiar with this concept of the long tail probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, and that as we go further down into the tail, you'll see less and less agreement. So at the very least, they should agree on you know, what the most popular show is, right? Uh, not quite. Uh, from, from this chart compares the three social media analytics firms in terms of where the overlap is in the top 25 programs. So it charts from the most popular to the 25th most popular, the percentage agreement as we work our way down the list. And if you look on the very far left, what this, what this tells you is that many of these services, none of them even agree on what the single most popular program is online, and in some of them don't see any agreement until they get to the fourth most popular program. Uh, so we don't see a, a lot, except in the, in the, with the yellow line between general sentiment and bluefin, we do see a bit of substantial agreement early on that eventually trails off and all of them end up at around the 40% range in terms of their uh, overall agreement. But even in the, what we don't see is this early pattern of there being substantial agreement amongst the three or four or five top programs. They don't even agree that much at that point which again highlights the fact that these are, to me, very different services capturing very different dimensions of online audience uh, engagement. Here we start to compare them to Nielsen data. So to what extent does online conversation map against traditional exposure as measured by Nielsen? Uh, and here we see some differences. Again, some don't agree at all early on, uh, but some agree quite a bit and start to taper off. This is a comparison between Bluefin uh, and Nielsen, um, at both the household level and at the 12 to 34 level. The yellow is the 12 to 34, and the blue, if, if that's not blue, I apologize because I'm colorblind. Maybe it's pink for all I know. Uh, that's what I get for letting my wife help me with these and not tell me in advance what the colors were. Um, but. Um, Trender and Nielsen, here again we see, not surprising, a substantial amount of agreement at the 12 to 34 and social media metrics level, or, um, and then it starts to taper off, and then very little agreement when we start looking at the, at the household level. Those levels of agreement start out very low, and again, no agreement at all, even amongst the top three programs, tick up a bit, and then hold fairly steady. And then lastly, here we compare general sentiment and Nielsen, again, at the household level and at the 12 to 34 level. Uh, we see that same general pattern again. But again, I think it's important to emphasize that more often than not, these services are not even agreeing 
with each other and not even agreeing with Nielsen at the level of what are the single most popular programs. Uh, again, to emphasize that these are, these are tapping at very different sources of, 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 of audience value, potentially. What does this mean for us? Uh, I, I just want to talk a bit about what I think are the perils that need to be avoided when we talk, you know, how to avoid data determinism. Uh, obviously, as you might expect, I would advocate for more of this kind of comparative analysis of alternative measurement systems. How do they compare to each other? How do their representations of the audience differ? Uh, and again, I've only been able to give you sort of a, a little bit of, of, the, of the data we've been analyzing on this so far. Um, we need to force data providers to open up their black boxes uh, so that we can understand how these representations of the audience are created. Uh, and lastly, we need to assess and not assume uh, relationships between these metrics and desired performance outcomes. That is, why do we care whether, how popular programs are online? What evidence do we have that that has any relationship to the things that matter to advertisers, whether it is product purchasing behavior, brand awareness, et cetera? Uh, we're not seeing that kind of rigorous analysis yet that needs to, uh, to, to, to start happening immediately. Well, thank you very much, and if you want to see more of this type of work, there's my, my blog, and uh, again, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today.